Hi, you're listening to It Happened to Me, a rare disease and medical challenges podcast. The mission of our podcast is to support you, our listeners, and to create community as you confront the toughest challenges in life. All of us will experience health hardships. The real question is how we adapt. That's the focus of It Happened to Me, which wants to help you overcome limitations and live a full and satisfying life. Drawing on their own health challenges, co-hosts Kathy Gildenhorn and Beth Glassman interview guests who share stories and research to help you succeed in the face of difficult health obstacles. It happened to me. I'm not alone, and neither are you. At the age of 33, Brooke Eby received a devastating diagnosis. After four years of confusing symptoms in her leg, Brooke was diagnosed with ALS in March of 2022. She hopes to spread awareness of ALS to as many people as possible and laugh along the way. Brooke has appeared as a guest on the Today Show, interviewed by Savannah Guthrie. Listeners, you can follow along with Brooke's journey across all social media platforms at at Limp Bruise Kit. And you can find that in the notes for this episode. Brooke, welcome to It Happened to Me, I'm Not Alone and Neither Are You. Let's start with the basics. What is ALS? And is there anything in particular you should look out for to give you a clue that, that is something you want to check into? Thank you so much for having me and for letting me spotlight ALS to begin with. I think it's a disease that people have heard of through the ice bucket challenge, but I think if you were to ask someone, what is it exactly? I'm not sure many people could pinpoint it. So I'll give it sort of the layman's terms because I don't have a medical background either. So this is the way I understand it. Basically, we have these things, everyone has something called motor neurons inside their body, and they're kind of like communication mechanisms between your brain and your muscles. So if I tell my foot to move, my motor neurons are the ones allowing that communication. With ALS, those motor neurons die progressively. So for me, that started with my left foot stopped being able to pick up and flex this way. So I started having trouble walking and I started limping and that happens to every muscle in your body over time. So that could be your arms, your core, your neck, all the way to the muscles that help control your voice box and your lungs, which means for ALS, for people with ALS, the ability to breathe and to speak and to swallow all becomes reliant on machines if that's possible. So I'm expected to be fully paralyzed because of ALS. Usually they give you a timeframe of about two to five years for a prognosis when you're diagnosed. I'm lucky in that I've had symptoms for five years. I'm still gabbing away. So my voice is not affected yet. It's really just in my legs. Uh, In terms of what people should look out for, I hate I hate saying this because I, I worry that after someone sees when I talk about symptoms, they immediately think they have ALS too. So these are not always specific to ALS, but for me, I started with weakness in my left foot. It's called drop foot where I could not keep my foot raised up. So when I was walking, my foot would just slap along the ground. And then I also had muscle twitching. They call them fasciculations where your muscles twitch like crazy. It looks like your skin is jumping. For me, they're not painful. Mm. For some people they are, but it's just very aggressive twitching and muscle weakness so far for me. Other symptoms that I'm expected to get are, like I said, trouble speaking, slurring my speech, trouble swallowing, um, trouble breathing, all of that falls into ALS. Well, I've got to ask the million dollar question. And that is, what happened to you? Take us on your diagnostic journey, please. It was a long journey. It was a four-year process for me to get a diagnosis. So Mm. four years of testing and trying to figure out what was happening. So in 2018, I was working at Salesforce. I still work there, but I was walking to one of their conferences 
in New York City, and I could not keep up with my coworkers. And I even had a couple of coworkers say, it kind of looks like you're limping. I don't know if maybe your shoe is hurting you or something's going on. And that kind of kicked off a four-year process where I had my sister, who's a doctor, do a little living room test. She saw that my foot was dropping. So she assumed I slipped a disc. No one really thought it was serious at the beginning because, you know, a limp pops up out of nowhere. You just have to assume you have a muscle injury or something. After uh, probably hundreds of appointments, I mean, I saw orthopedic surgeons. I saw every kind of doctor, PTs, OTs. I ended up going to a neurologist about two years into the symptoms. They ran something called an EMG where they place needles in your muscles. It's it's a deeply uncomfortable test to think about, but they put needles in your muscles and they see the muscle response to you flexing those muscles. They could clearly tell something was wrong with my left foot, but it wasn't showing anywhere else in my body, which isn't enough data to give wow. a progressive disease diagnosis. And so I kind of just had to go back to living my life, knowing that my limp was getting worse. And it, it seemed like my calf was getting skinnier, atrophying a bit, but because they didn't diagnose me, I sort of put everything else into the back of my mind and said, well, we'll deal with that when we have to. And two years later, so four years into this, I started losing my balance quite a bit. So I went back to a neurologist and they ran the EMG. And this time they saw issues with both the left and the right foot. So that was when the doctor was like, oh God, I'm going to have to be the one to tell her this. After four years of us thinking it wasn't this, they basically said, we don't like what we're seeing. It looks like it has progressed and we can officially call it a motor neuron disease. And then, you know, a month later, they officially declared it ALS. Wow. I'm so sorry, Brooke. I, I, am, s- I am so sorry. How, how did you handle that diagnosis? Yeah, I'm, I would say the first three months, I'll call it, were pure survival. I, I was in shock. I mean, I wasn't, yes. I wasn't having like natural reactions to things. Someone would ask me about my day and I would just start crying. Like I, it was a volatile emotional time, but there was, there was a turning point about three months in. I mean, I, I will say I went to the neurologist and I was like, I, I couldn't stop crying when I was talking to her. And she was like, I honestly think like an antidepressant might help you at this time to get through this. So I immediately started that and it did help. She was right. It it definitely helped me feel like I could start managing what I was going through. Um, but yeah, it was, it was survival. I was reading about a book a day to try to just escape in my mind. I was eating so many M&Ms. I feel like M&Ms needs to sponsor this disease because of what it got me through. Um, it was bleak. It, it wasn't a time I would want to repeat. Like, I, I can't believe that was a year ago from now, I would say a year ago from now, I was coming out of that haze, but it's so weird to see yourself in the past and think, man, like I, I, that was a dark couple months that I had to power through. Well, that is such a, um, it's such an honest and open response, uh, to a difficult, a difficult situation. And I think, uh, being so open about taking the antidepressant was, um, I think, very helpful for our guests and and your other coping mechanisms, maybe yeah. eating a special treat or reading right. books, um, and and maybe a good cry. Um, all these are are so helpful and and so incredibly honest. Can I ask you? Um, Where are we with ALS as far as treatments are concerned? Are there medications that the doctors are giving you? Are you on one? Um, Yeah, it's it's a good question. To maybe slow down the progress. Right. So today, if you Google what medications are there for ALS, they list out six medications, but... Hmm. 
I have to go through them because it's kind of a, a false number in my mind. Mm -hmm. So there's one medication that is strictly for mood, something called uh -huh. pseudo bulbar effect. So certain people get this affect with ALS where they laugh inappropriately, cry inappropriately. Uh so that's one medication it's considered for ALS, but it's not to treat ALS. So I see we're down to five. Yes. Then right. there's another one that is strictly for a genetic form of ALS, which 10% of ALS cases are genetic. The other 90% are what's considered sporadic. They just come out of the blue. Wow. I see. That's that. Now we're down to four. Now we're down to four. Now uh -huh. two of the remaining four are the exact same medication, just with different, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's a brand name or if maybe one right. is for like outside of the US. So we're really at three medications in my mind, if you're a sporadic patient, all three of them are intended to slow progression. None is intended to reverse progression, halt progression. It is strictly a means to slow the disease down. Yeah. So what's tricky in my mind about that is with ALS, I always see my progression like this. Like I'm always getting worse. Maybe I should go this direction for you. I can't tell if I'm reversed or not but you're always getting worse. And they say, yeah. take this medication and it should taper off that. You're still going to go down, but you're going to go yeah. down at a slower rate. Slower. So those three medications are intended to slow it down by a couple of them, say by a matter of months, some of them judge it based on percentage um, of life. So it's kind of hard to measure in my mind because I'm still getting worse. And I'm like, am I getting worse faster or slower than I was before? Um, so it's hard for me to judge the effectiveness of it. I mean, I, I'm a slow progressor to begin with, so something's working right for me, but there's just so much unknown about ALS and it's, it's frustrating as a patient. And I'm sure even more so as a scientist or a doctor, because we don't know why most people get it. The disease looks so different for everyone. I mean, if you talk to five different people with ALS, you see five entirely different diseases. Interesting. Wow. Huh. Is there any is there, exciting if, medication on the horizon? Anything, any research that's going on? I ask, I too have a very rare neurodegenerative syndrome. And there's all sorts of, it's, it's 10 years off probably, but um, all sorts of possibilities for the future. I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful. So to give kind of a, a timeline, the first medication of those three was approved in 1995, I believe it was. Mm. The next two were in 2022 and 2023. Oh, oh, so wow. We're, seeing, we're obviously seeing an increase in results or perhaps just a, a lowering of testing that the FDA is requiring, they are getting a bit more flexible because again, ALS is such a hopeless disease that the risk, we're not very risk averse in ALS world because we don't right. have the opportunity to be. So those types of numbers give me hope. They're also, they just announced that a medication called Neuron is getting an advisory committee meeting in September. So that oh. means that I'll give like a 30 second explanation on neuron because it was just explained to me. So again, patient side, if you're a doctor, I'm sorry if I'm messing all this up, but there's this medication called neuron where you take spinal fluid out of the ALS patient, mix it with neuron. I'm sure that's not the medical term and then put it back into the patient. And they ran a trial back. I want to say like 2017 or 2019, a few years ago. And they actually had some patients saw stopping of symptoms and some, a small number saw some reversal of symptoms, which like mm, I said, that's huge. Of. It's huge. Yeah. So the people, so there's a lot of advocates that have been pushing for neuron since it failed its first trial. Um, because I was going to ask you, was this in a clinical trial? It was, and it failed because it only worked for a certain segment of patients. So they saw the people who are earlier in the disease have stopping of symptoms, reversal of symptoms, whereas people further along in the disease, they didn't see any harm, but they didn't, it didn't beat the placebo for those patients. Mm -hmm. 
So it failed because that's how that process works. And so people have been petitioning for an ad com where the FDA can take a look at the data, have patients speak, have advocates speak. And that was officially scheduled for September with a decision intended to be made in December. So if we're looking at something to give us hope, uh, that's the one in the near future. I think there's more and more being done in the research world. And that's really where I've targeted fundraising is towards research, because I am hopeful that they'll find at least something to extend life for long enough until there's another breakthrough. Like at this point, it's just the game of preservation in my mind. Wow. Wow. Well, I got to ask you, how do you cope today? Because I heard you tell a wonderful wedding story that helped change your attitude. And can you share that beautiful story with our listeners today? Because it's outstanding. Yeah, absolutely. And it's it's a friend of the podcast, actually, who's the, the main star of this story. So I, as I mentioned, I had those two to three months of just survival, shock, crying, chocolate, all of it. Um, it was like how they picture Brad, bad breakups in movies where it's just like the girl in her bed eating chocolate. That was actually me. <laughs> um, and then one of my good friends from college was getting married and she had asked me to be a bridesmaid long before my diagnosis. But it was in May. I had been diagnosed in March. And so I was like, okay, now's the time to come out of you know this this weird state that I've been in. So I showed up to the wedding with a walker and I was so embarrassed. I mean, there's, that's not the way you want to have a college reunion is using a mobility aid. Like the bride's grandparent came in with the same walker I was using. And I was like, you gotta be kidding me. Like we had the matching tennis balls on the bottom. I was just, I was so embarrassed. And so I turned to my best friend, Jackie, um, who's, I think mom is, is a friend of the podcast and I was like, we got to go home. I can't do this. Let's just leave. Like the bride will forgive me. And she was like, okay. Or what if we just tried to make this really fun and I'll be right next to you the whole time. Like, let's try to enjoy whatever we can, like just try to turn it around. And so I just like rolled my eyes kind of and walked in with her. And about, I would say an hour or two later, I was giving people walker rides all over the dance floor. The bride was doing the limbo under my walker. And like, there were points where Jackie and I were like, how else can we get the attention more on us with this walker? Like we were having so much fun. Um, And after that, I was like, okay, I don't really think, you know, this is, I I should feel embarrassment or like shame around this. I think people want uh, to know what I'm going through, but they mostly just want their old friend and to have fun. And so that, moment I would say is the turning point where I went from depressed and sad and not I guess like grief that was the grief period because I kept thinking like I thought my life was going to be this what if I didn't do x y and z like I was just constantly questioning and that point forward I was like okay I think I can handle this and we should just try to make a good situation out of it Oh, what fun oh, at that fun. wedding. There's what some good pure, pictures if you need them. I have. I love it. Pictures. What pure joy of living you're, yeah. you're exuding. It's all I love it. I love it. And, and as Savannah Guthrie said on the Today Show, it's definitely all about heart and humor with yeah. you. I mean, just so beautiful. And where does that come from? Is it something that you always used in challenging situations or when you were growing up, or is it something that just kind of happened at that moment? I have always been a goofball. I've never (laughs) been, I've never been serious. Like I've never been able to listen to like deep conversation. I'm, I'm always the one jumping in with a joke. I think it's, I was the youngest of three. So growing up like that, you, you have to find a joke in order to be part of the conversation. Cause I rarely knew what anyone was talking about, but I was like, if I can make them laugh, I'll feel included to my two much older siblings. And so that's sort of the approach I know how to take. Anytime something's been hard in my life, I've never been able to take it seriously 
as seriously as it probably should be taken. Um, so that, that part came naturally. I think the part that I'm learning as I go is like the whole advocacy side of this, because when you get a diagnosis like this, you're immediately thrown in to this advocacy world. Um, I mean, you don't have to be, I should say, I mean, I think there's a role for everyone and however you want to advocate, but for me, I've been very public with my story and trying to learn that side of things. Like how, how do I effectively help the ALS community? Like what steps will actually help people versus, you know, what have we been doing in the past that hasn't worked? Trying to learn those things is the hard part. The jokes still come to me pretty easily. <laughs> you know, well, Brooke, one thing is... that we we have found in uh, doing this podcast and people who have um, rare diseases or medical challenges, they all seem to have something in common and that is advocacy. And that seems to be a coping tool. Do you think that is the same for you? It's interesting when I someone asked me like, how, how is TikTok or what, what's the purpose of like doing these public things? And I kept talking about how I thought it was helping the community and helping people with ALS. And I remember my boyfriend being like, does it not help you at all? And I was like, oh my God, of course. Why is that not my first answer? Because when I first started, I really couldn't even talk about ALS without crying. I would just immediately yeah. get choked up. I'd get emotional if people were asking me questions. And I think the more I've talked about it with a bunch of strangers on the internet, the more I'm like, I'm almost able to separate it from myself a little bit, you know, like this yes. is now my purpose as opposed to my pain, which yes. I know it's like, I know that's a big quote is like turning pain into purpose, but it's true. Like, I think once the, once the grief period subsided and who knows it might come back, but I was able to say like, okay, instead of saying like, why did this happen to me? It's like, let's make it for a reason that it happened to me. Let's not just waste the opportunity. How beautiful. I mean, this whole yes. attitude towards an incredibly challenging medical diagnosis is inspiring. And I'm just wondering, is it empowering for you, a real source of strength and resilience in moving forward and in tackling your future? The advocacy piece? No, I'm talking about the heart and the humor and the whole joy of living and it. It, it, appreciating life to its fullest. I think there's something... I mean, you talk to a lot of people, I, I would imagine, with like very serious diagnoses, if that's the plural. Yeah. And there's something about like once the facade of perfect life goes away, it's like the worst thing that's happened could have could happen or the worst thing that could happen has happened is the better way to put it. Like I got the diagnosis that no one wants. And so now I'm like, okay, well, nothing, what else can happen to me? Like I, if I'm able to get through this, I think, um, you know, it, I guess empowering is the right word. It's, it's more just like understanding more about life. Now I think I'm a lot more focused on the things that make me happy, like friends, family, um, you know, those two things really for me are like, if I could see those people throughout the week, I'm having a good week. So it's so there's oh, like it, it almost just like makes me smile. You make me smile. Life. Yeah. So this is this is more coping strategies. As I as I'm listening to you, and and I think this is so important for our listeners. So surrounding yourself with friends and family and joy is another one of your coping is a coping mechanism. Completely. I mean, that's what got yeah. me out of the, the funk to begin with was yeah. friends. Um, and, and I, I can't imagine going through this without a supportive network, which is why whenever people say like, what's the first thing you would suggest to someone who's been diagnosed with ALS or with anything else, I always say find a support group because mm. I'm really lucky that I have friends and family that, you know, I've, had around since I was a baby. Like my friends I've known since kindergarten for the most part. 
And oh. so not everyone has that. And I can imagine, I can't imagine what going through this would have been like without them. So I think a support group is always like my number one piece of advice. Go find people who are going through this same thing that you are. You can ask them questions, but it's also just to not make you feel so alone. So now you're a social media sensation. Bro. <laughs> you're known worldwide. Um, sensation. And, and how do you, have you been shocked by that? That uh, you've really taken off because honestly it's, because of who you are. I mean, you're, you're special. There's something very special about you. I am absolutely uh, between welling up with tears and smiling for joy. There is something uh, extraordinarily special about you. Thank you. Were you surprised by this? Of course. I, I mean, the way it started was after that wedding, I got COVID and oh, no. I know. It was oh. a great little great little parting gift, but oh. uh I got really really sick and I was like it was basically oh. a month of having a flu is how it felt. Oh. But I kept trying to break my fever. And so I took a bath and I don't know if it was like the heat of the bath mixed with my fever or what, but I like opened up the notes app on my phone and I started writing down ideas for videos that I could make or really just like oh. ideas of the funny moments I had experienced since being diagnosed like I, I was just thinking of little things with my family things that you know the girl the my nieces would ask me my little kid nieces would ask me and just all these funny moments that I had experienced and so I started writing them down I barely remember doing it and half of them don't make sense but a week later, I got brunch with the same Jackie. I swear I have more than one friend, but I, I name her the most and <laughs> I showed it to her. And I was like, should we try something with this? Like I've never, I didn't even have TikTok on my phone. I was like, should we try it? And uh, we filmed the first one together because I didn't want to do it alone. I was too embarrassed. And it kind of just took off. I think, I think the contrast between seeing a young person who seems very alive talking about death or relate things related to death, I think grabs people's interest to begin with. And then, you know, I just have to hope that they stick around and learn more about ALS and just hopefully get it a little more well-known. So our listeners are hearing this story. What would you like them to do with regard to ALS? It's a great question. I find the calls to action with ALS to be really big and scary. So I try to I try to simplify them for people um, based on what I've seen in you know only my year. Sometimes I feel like you're as, a senior is asking for a, fr a freshman for advice in these situations yes. because I'm like I don't really know. But here's what I'm currently doing. Um, so in the, the month of May was ALS awareness month. I posted a video huh. every day on TikTok and Instagram during that month and Twitter during that month. And my last day was the call to action day. And I asked people one to share my story with like f three to five of their friends, because I just wanted a few more people to see what ALS could look like. And then two, I started a fundraiser on my Instagram page for a an ALS research lab called ALS TDI. I started that with the goal of 25,000 and it was a 30 day fundraiser. We hit 25,000 before I went to bed that night of posting. Oh, the wow. oh. How much did you raise? So then I raised the goal to 50. We got there in five days. So then oh. I raised the goal to 75. And then I got a, uh, really, I got a DM on Instagram from someone who wants to stay anonymous saying, if you get to a hundred, I'll match it. Oh my goodness. Wow. So I posted a video on Friday saying, let's get this thing to a hundred. We have two weeks and then it'll get matched. And 12 hours later we hit a hundred. <gasps> oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. It was, I, I'm still in shock from that. I don't think that's sunk in yet. But I just had a call with the anonymous donors. I call them KJ. That's that's the nickname I've given them. And I just had a call with them. And we were like, 
what's next now? Like we, we hit that goal that we were, we have two weeks to do in 12 hours. And so for me now, I think it's continuing to fundraise. I think like people, so many people are giving like $5 and it, it adds up so quickly. We have, I think it's like 2,300 people have donated. So, and we've seen people write in the comments, like I just it's payday like I just got my paycheck I'm so excited oh. I can contribute and they'll donate oh. five dollars and like it's just so <laughs> magical to watch and I have a front row seat I'm just refreshing my Instagram at all times so that's like I would say the the thing to take away is like ALS is an underfunded disease the ice bucket challenge I think it spread a lot of awareness it was a really good first step but you can see the progress that it's made 10 years later, where we're still sitting at three medications that aren't really moving the needle. I mean, we're grateful for any medication to get approved, but it's certainly not ones that, you know, will allow me to live a normal lifespan like everyone else. So I think the number one issue is, is money towards the disease. So that's what I've been focusing on, but there's also other ways to get involved. So if you see yourself as some form of advocate, whether that's like on the legislative side, or, you know, you want to focus on veterans because they're two times more likely to get ALS. There is an organization, I am ALS that does a ton of advocacy work. So I'd recommend that. And then also calling your Congress people or emailing them. If you don't like phone calls, I've, I've learned that Gen Z and the millennials do not like making phone calls. So yes. you can email them too and ask for more funding for ALS, accelerated uh, approvals for ALS. Like there, I think there's a role for everyone in helping ALS, depending on what you're interested in. So hopefully that wasn't too rambly for people to follow, but just know like, we need as many advocates as we can get. That's so wonderful and so exciting. And that fundraiser was just it's awe-inspiring. Insane. It's incredible. It's, and It was shocking. Like I, I still, I don't know when it will hit me. I almost felt like I was hung over the next morning and it wasn't <laughs> drinking. It was just like, Aww. there was such a high, high. And then I was like, oh my God, what, what now? Like I have to keep this going. So I'm hoping we can get some celebrities to start getting involved and I'm calling it like a pass the match situation. So I had these anonymous donors match my hundred K. How can we start getting public figures to say like, I'll match it, but I'm going to pass it to my celebrity friend to match it and see if we can make some progress there too. Oh, that would be outstanding. What yeah, a great more celebrities idea. Celebrities need a, a platform to fall back on, you know, mm-hmm. I, like there's certain, there are certain celebrities that have very clear causes, but I think there are also a ton that, that, that need don't. one and yes. it could be ALS. Absolutely. Now, is there any parting advice you'd like to share with our listeners today about rare diseases, medically challenging diseases, and ALS in particular? I think... I always, I already said, join a support group, but that, that really helped me. Like I joined my local support group and it was me and a bunch of people who did not look like me. It was mostly older men. And I was like, wow, lightning really struck with me. Didn't it? Like, how did I, why am I here? And then I found a group of women who were all diagnosed before they turned 35. And the group, uh, oh, wow. there's like 50 something of us at this point, but it it's growing every month. Like we we're seeing more and more young people get diagnosed with this. And that saved me a lot because now I have peers that I can talk to and ask questions to. I think wow. like in terms of emotional advice, I mean, I'm, I think I'm a bit of a freak of nature in that I was able to sort of go from depression to okay in like three months, I think that time probably should have been longer. Like I I think everyone should allow themselves that grief period of asking like, why me? Why, what's my life going to look like? What am I supposed to do next? Um, But there'll come a point where you understand why it's you. I think ALS picks very specific people. Like 
people with certain strengths because the ALS world needs them. For me, like for me, that's, you know, not being embarrassed of putting my face on the internet 30 times a day. But there's also people who are like ex lawyers who are helping us on the legislative side. There's Steve Gleason, who's a huge name for the ALS world. And he's done a ton with things like disability benefits. Like everyone's playing a very specific role to help the community. Um, So I think once you understand what your role can be, it's more of an additive part of your life, even though it can be very dark. I don't want to minimize that because there are, there's a lot of heaviness that comes with it. But I love you. You are a force. Unbelievable. You you are a force. And when you say ALS chose you, I I have trouble even grasping that. But you are a force of nature. And I, I feel honored that you chose to come on our podcast today and share your story with us. I, I'm honored um, you picked me. Thank you so much. I really, um, I've learned so much from you. And your I've guts, learned so much. Your guts and courage. And then the joy, the humor, all of that together, Brooke, is really, um, well, I don't think I'll ever be the same after speaking with you. That's and I don't think our listeners will either. I think you've last, you left us with a lasting thumbprint, a brook. We're oh, all absolutely. affected by you. We are, we are all affected by you and we're gonna carry your thumbprint on us. Thank you. And, and I, and I really am grateful. And oh, I just love how you've gone from grief and recognizing that it was an important um, yeah. emotion to go through, but from grief to joy to and living to humor to social media to raising awareness and to advocacy in a way that worked for you so that you really feel like you're contributing to ALS, just as Beth said. Uh, we love how you, uh, your whole attitude and perspective and it just, Thank you for being here. Ah, thank you both so much. This is like the pep talk I need every morning. This is the best. <laughs> oh. Well, it's it's really been a joy to have you as a guest today on It Happened to Me. I'm not alone and neither are you. I want to share with our listeners that they can follow you. Okay, it's Limp Bruise Kit. There you have it, everyone. <laughs> From the That's lady it. who created it. It's Brooke. It's Brooke's platform. Please follow it. And I know we will. We will be following you, Brooke. Thank you so much. This has been great. Oh, what a what a pleasure to have you on and to meet you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of It Happened to Me. We encourage you to learn more at ithappentomepod.com. Please use the contact form on our website to submit your guest suggestions, comments, questions, ideas, and feedback for the show. You can also email us directly at ithappentomepod at gmail.com. We would really appreciate it if you can leave us a five-star rating and review on your podcast app like Apple or Spotify. This helps others in the rare disease and medical challenge community find us. It Happened to Me is created and hosted by Kathy Gillenhorn and Beth Glassman. I'm Kira Deneen from DNA Today, and I serve as our executive producer and marketing lead. Amanda Andrioli is our associate producer. Ashlyn Anokian is our graphic designer. And remember, it happened to me. I'm not alone, and neither are you.